everybody. Thanks so much for joining us right here on The Right View. Tonight, we're joined by Turning Point contributor, my friend Aaron Elmore and former Trump media advisor and national co-chair of Women for Trump, another friend, Dr. Gina Loudon. Um, Aaron and Gina, welcome to the show. A lot of tea tonight, I got to tell you. Um, we just got done with the Super Bowl, first of all. And so I want to get some top line thoughts from you guys because Aaron... You're from Philly. Yes. Uh, Gina, you are from Kansas City, right? So well, from Missouri. Yeah. From Missouri. Okay. Yeah, you're from Missouri, but not Kansas City specific. Okay, but you are a Kansas City fan. So congrats to you, Aaron. Sorry. I mean, what a what an L for you guys. I hated to see it for you. Uh, how was the game, in your opinion, Aaron? And what was your favorite Super Bowl ad? Um, well, it was a tough game. It was actually a very good game to watch. It was you know, a good close. matchup, I got to say. It really was. But Philly always finds a way to screw something up. But <laughs> as a town, I feel like Philadelphia really needed this. You know, we're, we're struggling with a lot of crime. There's so much going on. It, which, it would have just been nice after our baseball Phillies lost almost in the 11th hour after not oh. thinking we would make the playoffs. So it would have been nice to bring a trophy home. <laughs> But at least it was a great matchup and a good game. And I love that our coach was so patriotic, crying during the national anthem. Oh, my God. Was that was so sweet. Beautiful moment. Yes. I loved it. Favorite Super Bowl ad. What did you think? Did, were you watching them? I watched the ads. Uh, my favorite was the Ben Affleck working at Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and J-Lo pulling up, kind of razzing him per usual. It sort of felt like art imitating life and life yeah. imitating art. I liked the um, the uh, Alicia Silverstone uh, whole, what's it called? What can't I think of the movie? Clueless. Clueless. God, is, am I that old? Then we got to halftime uh-huh. and I was like, oh, Rihanna's coming out. Let me watch this. I got my kids in bed like just in time for the halftime. Uh, Aaron, what'd you think? Well, I mean, there were a lot of sort of satanic symbolisms mixed with Oompa Loompa from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory <laughs> or Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, I think the big takeaway was less about her performance because the performance sort of fell flat. There was nothing yeah. really special about it. She barely moved around. But the takeaway was that she is pregnant again just after having a baby on, I think, May 19th. Ooh. So she got back to business really quickly. But she didn't make a formal pregnancy announcement. She alluded to it by saying, I think I'm going to bring a special guest with me. But if that were me, I would want to celebrate that moment and that baby bump and that maternity with sort of a big reveal of it right she i wanted of- to see like i actually i looked it up i stopped using google because aaron you told me to use duck duck go p.s if anybody <laughs> out there wants to it doesn't flow off the tongue like googled it but if anybody wants to not have your information tracked duck duck go is the the browser to use and I it's guess. not just about tracking it also gives you more accurate results there you go and they're not like if yeah you su- if you google who not can have cute. a baby in google it says a man can have a baby. At least DuckDuckGo gives you some of the real results. But anyway. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. I looked it up as this performance was happening. I was like, is she pregnant? And then I saw she had just had a baby. I was like, man, maybe it's like that the baby weight hasn't come off. And look, I have never performed at a halftime show in full transparency. I'm waiting for the request to come. I'm sure there <laughs> it's going to be maybe next year or the following that they'll Absolutely. they'll call on me. No, there was nothing crazy that happened except Aaron. Maybe I the the Philly fans did get a little crazy. You guys had the light poles greased. Either way, and good and good thing I guess because you know some people <laughs> got a little wild. I heard last night in Philly, but I have a lot of of people who I'm friends with who either are from Philly like you or from New Jersey and claim the Eagles. So sorry about the loss for everybody. Yeah, and it was a tough one. It, but the good news is it's Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day to both of you ladies. Happy um, Valentine's Day. Do you guys celebrate? Like, do your husbands actually do things for you? Or do they go by the old adage that this is just like a Hallmark holiday? Because I'll tell you, Eric Eric Trump will tell you that this is just, they made this one up. But he's always very nice. And I always get some flowers on Valentine's Day. How about you guys? Aww. I bet I'm getting flowers, but Craig and I, well, well we have a longstanding tradition of eating hot dogs on Valentine's oh, Day. Love it. <laughs> but of course. this year we will be at the baseball field with a game. Aww. I don't want any presents. My life is all a gift. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think it's going to be super romantic over at the baseball fields. That's nice. Night. But they do have hot dogs there. So it's a well, you could do, you could carry on the tradition. Gina, how about you? What's happening on Valentine's for you? 
Yeah, we we always go out to dinner, um, just to, the two of us, someplace uh, fun and maybe a little romantic. And he is very good about getting gifts. But I read the most beautiful Instagram post today, um, and it was talking about you know the the real flowers, uh, the real gift for Valentine's Day or any of these, uh, as Eric would say, sensationalized uh, holidays is you know that that three a.m. feeding that you got up and did for me, uh, that you dropped everything to you know to to take me someplace, believing in my career and my dreams, you know, th those are the real Valentine's Day oh. gifts. And over Canada, um, let's see, as of current count, we had the one last week before the State of the Union that got shot down off the coast of South Carolina, one that was shot down over the Yukon in uh, Canada, one shot down in Michigan and one in Alaska. And I don't know, I mean, the, the press secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre at the White House, um, Aaron seemed to kind of poke fun about it and say, you know, it's not aliens. I did love E.T. as the movie or whatever. Um, but I don't know. This makes a lot of people kind of feel like we are being invaded at this point. And I don't know how else you look at it if we have all of these objects above our airspace. Who knows what their purpose is? Who knows what their goals are? I don't know. What have you been your thoughts on all of this? Lots of thoughts, but we're certainly not showing peace through strength, right? No. I mean, we are actually showing weakness when we should be showing strength. We should be shooting these objects down. We shouldn't have a press secretary who's laughing and saying, hee hee, this is like E.T. We should be saying we are the strongest nation in the world. We are the United States. And if you come into our airspace, you will be dealt with accordingly. And there are a lot of the people that are a little bit more, let's say, conspiratorial, but we know the difference between the truth and a conspiracy theory, six months. So a lot of the things yeah, exactly. that we thought weren't real are becoming real. Some people out there are saying this is just a massive distraction for the nightmare that is Joe Biden and Washington and the failures of the COVID vaccine and the cover-up of Hunter Biden's laptop. So there are people that are saying, hmm, is there something more afoot here? These have the United States writing on them. Is this a big ruse? Is this a big cover up? But either way, the United States should be showing that we are strong and we are powerful. And no matter who or what you are, you shouldn't be invading our airspace. But if they are aliens, they're going to come down here and see the pronouns and the kneeling before the flag. Oh. And they'll go back to wherever they came from. If that's the case, I'm like these people are crazy. Yeah, we, we got to go. go with them. I know. Maybe we should ask to go. Um, I'm just hoping for the best. But unfortunately, I think we might be headed towards a, a really scary place. Um, but speaking of pronouns and nonsense, and we'll just take it all the way to children transitioning. I read this article last week about a mother who had major regrets. She wrote a whole uh, op-ed, I guess, about the fact that she let her son at four years old oh. transition to a girl. Now, this was socially. There wasn't any sort of medication given or no surgeries, but she allowed her son at four. My daughter is three and my son is five, so I am like in the thick of right where yeah. this woman would have been. Dressed like a girl, change you know, changed her son's name to a girl's name and called her son by female pronouns um, and actually was told by a gender therapist to break ties with anyone who would not recognize her son's new pronouns. Um, she said it felt like she was leaving a cult when she finally realized the mistake that she had made. And she really had been a true believer, she says, in gender ideology. We have young kids. And um, I, it, this kind of thing to me, I, I just, I don't know where this one ends either. You know, talk about, we don't know what's happening with all these aircraft or unidentified objects above our airspace. Where do we end with this? Because what we've obviously seen is the increase uh, in children and I'm talking like young children all the way up through high school age kids who are identifying as transgender. I mean, it's skyrocketed. It's thousands and thousands of percent higher than it even was like five or 10 years ago, let alone like 20 or 30 years ago. From 2017 to 2021, insurance claims for puberty blockers went up 120 plus percent because it's being so readily dispensed. And then you think about the fact that 
you have so many states across the country where parents don't need to be notified necessarily if their child in school is being is, is asking to be called a different pronoun or in some cases, like in uh, California, you can go and actually start the transition process without approval of your parents at a, a relatively young age. I don't know. I, I mean, we're going to have a messed up uh, generation of kids at the very least. At the very least, because you know what I want to call it? Trans Inc. These hospitals, these doctors, there's these psychologists and psychiatrists are making big, big, big money on this. And there's been a little yeah. bit of an expose. If you dig hard enough on the internet, you'll see a top surgery surgery can get a hospital like $40,000. So it's not just about the parents that are coming in there saying, please fix my child. I am struggling with them emotionally, psychologically, physically. The parents want a switch to be flipped to fix their precious children. And I think some of them just don't know any better. And they're at their wits end saying, Maybe this will just give me back my baby. And they go into these hospitals and what these hospitals are seeing. And every mom and dad out there should realize these hospitals see you as a dollar sign. Yeah. They want to steal your children for profit. They don't care about the well-being of your family and of your children. This is a lucrative big business. And those that aren't in the lucrative big business are unwell and want to see the upset of a normal nuclear family in our society. So most of these people that are motivated to do that are evil. And the parents that are struggling with losing their sweet, innocent children, I do feel that a lot of them just don't know any better and they're at their wits end. So maybe they'll see something like this or be able to do some other reading or talking about this mother who has tremendous guilt about the transition and say, wait a minute, let's dig a little deeper because we do see that the studies are showing that most children with gender confusion, I believe over 75, 80%, these children resolve it naturally without surgery, drugs, right. or mental and psychological abuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I, I think is so crazy to me is that it's become so glamorized, right? To the transgender whole issue is glamorized. Nobody wants to talk about it because you're, you're, you know, People think that you hate everybody if you say anything like she did, which is men shouldn't compete in women's sports. And I actually had a talk. Uh, I gave a public speech in Pennsylvania and to a lot of Republican women. And I said, do you want boys competing against your little girls? And everyone looked around the room and I said, ladies, if you don't start speaking up now, you're not going to have a voice. These are things that we need to speak out against. It's not mm -hmm. about the Leah Thomases, you know, the pen swimmer that is still biologically a man. It's not about them taking hormones. It's that men have a larger lung capacity, a different muscular structure, mm -hmm. different bones, different wingspans. There is no way for men and women to be in the same category in terms of physical athletics. And these girls that have been working for this their whole lives are getting passed over for scholarships, for opportunities in their future, for the Olympics. And this is not believe all women or support all women or the future is female. It's putting females back in a box and advancing men, which is the whole sort of hypocrisy of the liberal ethos on this. So it's really hard to watch. And I know one of the young swimmers came out recently and spoke out against sharing a locker room with Leah Thompson. So Leah is the Penn student that I spoke about earlier. Leah still has biological male sex organs externally, if I can put it that way. As, as Very well, eloquently like, put, very well said. So how can, thank you, how can you be in a locker room right. with young women like that? And oh, yeah. that's when our society is just being turned on its head. And that's when the Communist Party of China or you know, other forces that want to take us over say, look what these people are worrying about. Look what they're doing. We can yeah. go in there as a Trojan horse so easily and take them over because logic has been turned on its head. Common sense has been turned on its head. And this is not what we need as a society. And we're not helping women by no means. What I will say, though, is as a woman who competes uh, in sports as often as I can, nothing makes me happier than passing a guy on my bike, than passing a guy when I'm running. <laughs> then let me tell you something. That's a good feeling because I know deep down, as much as I hate to admit it, men are inherently better at those things than women. So when I get you in my sights out there, believe me, I'm, I'm going to die trying to beat you. And, and sometimes I do. And let me tell you, it's amazing. Love well, it. Laura, I pass you on my car while you're riding your bike all the time. It's <laughs> tremendous guilt. 
<laughs> That's it's a true tr- story. It's true. Yeah. You give me a little honk every every now and again. I appreciate that. Um, I just don't want to scare you while you're biking. So I try no, not to honk anymore. I'm good. I'm prepared for everything. I'm always, I'm always a head on a swivel at all times. You, you, you got to assume these people in cars don't see you on a bike. And a lot of times they don't. I, let me tell you that. To all the shout out to all the bikers out there. Um, last thing, and I got to get to this. I know we're running out of time, but they just revealed recently the safest place on a plane to be while you're flying. And to anybody out there that is spending money on the first class seats, I'm sorry to tell you, you are in one of the worst places to sit on the airplane. Uh, the best spots, by the way, are it's like the six rows on the aisle leading up to the toilets in the very back of the airplane. (laughs) So I know we're all like, oh, God, every now and again you get those seats. If the plane goes down, um, you're going to be in good shape, Gina, because that is apparently a good place to sit if you if you want to live. I often I'm always on the aisle, though, because I always have to get up and go to the bathroom and I never want to make people move. Sometimes I get on these planes and if I if I have the window seat, I try to kind of negotiate with the person who's on the aisle. And I'm like, listen, I just, (laughs) if you want this, you can have it because I'm so sorry. (laughs) Two of y'all are going to have to get up like the whole flight because I'm going to have to keep, I drink a lot of water. I try to stay hydrated. I don't know what to say for myself. Where where are you sitting on the planes, Erin? I mean, by the grace of God, if I have a few extra miles or points, I beg to get upgraded, but that doesn't happen because I don't like to travel anymore. I live in the best place in America, so I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, that's true. But I am a window so I can sort of sleep against the edge. But I do wonder if I put my tinfoil hat on. This is a little bit of predictive programming. Uh The airlines are now saying that they're going to reduce the... uh, the pilots from one to two, all of these pilots had to be vaccinated. They're talking about pilots having a lot of heart issues Mm -hmm. and we need two pilots. So maybe they're trying to make us comfortable and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm really not, but I just hope they're not trying to normalize things happening on planes because relatively speaking, we've had safe air travel and not a lot of incidents, Mm -hmm. but I'm not a nervous flyer. I don't want to be one of those people that gets on the plane, like white knuckling it. So I just get on that plane. I don't worry where I am other than if I'm right in the back next to the toilet. I just think I'm going to get to my destination safe and sound. Now you're safe back there by by the toilets. Here's the crazy thing. So, you're, I mean, you're right. It's what what use is it to get on a plane and get nervous because you're going to the plane's going to take off, whatever. Lynn Patton, who you have been on this show with before, Aaron, and I know, Gina, you know her, too. I've been friends with Lynn for like 15 years. OK, Lynn Patton, still to this day, when she gets on an airplane, will start a timer on her phone for three minutes because she's always said she's such a smart person. But I'm like, Lynn, this is stupid. What are you going to do anyway? She goes, the first three minutes statistically are when something is most likely to happen if you're going to crash. She's not totally wrong because apparently on December 18th, there was a flight from Maui to San Francisco. I don't know if you guys saw this. 71 seconds into the flight, and I thought immediately about Lynn, um, the the plane had had climbed to just over 2,000 feet and dropped. Let's keep them all on board. I think more pilots. I think give them more rest time. Let's get more in the mix because we all want to get to where we need to go and get there safely, except... God bless Gina. How long how long does the moratorium on your flying last? Um, until President Trump is uh, reelected, I think, Stop. probably. I, I mean, I don't know. I, that's just my guess. Uh, well, I feel like there's so much more I always want to talk about, but we're out of time for today. So I want to say a big thank you, of course, to Aaron and Gina for joining us here. You guys are amazing. And thanks, to everybody Laura. at home, as always, thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here next time for more.